All right, hi everybody. I hope that you had a fabulous fall break. Um, so remember that you have a problem set that is due today. Um, you can either turn it in in hard copy or by email. Um, and uh, for those of you who have sent some emails to me, I will be responding to those this afternoon. Um, you will also get another email from me this afternoon with a link to a doodle poll um, with some potential times for a review session since um, exam one is gonna be Monday ne of next week. Um, the review session format is going to be question answer. Um, so basically, uh, you have questions, I'll try to answer them. Um, it will go until you run out of questions. Um, I say that I have literally had them go for like two minutes and I have literally had them go for like hours. Um, it'll be set up over Zoom. Um, and like I said, uh, I'm going to give you a doodle poll. You can vote for as many times as you want on the doodle poll and the time with the most votes wins. Um, and I'll give you a time to respond by um, so that I can give you the rest of the info about that. Uh, so be on the lookout for that email um, and remember the uh, homework that is due today. Uh, so today we are uh, talking about B-cell development. Um, B-cell development is really um, related closely to VDJ recombination that we've been talking about thus far. And so remember that we've talked about the individual events that are happening um, to select and actually rearrange the DNA um, in VJ recombination. Um, and we see this making both the heavy chain and the light chain. We're sort of going to be taking almost like a step back um, now because we're actually going to start thinking about these events that you see on the right happening in a cell. And so we're going to think about how the cell times these events um, and regulates these events. Uh, so all of these events that we're going to be seeing are taking place in B cells because B cells are the cells that are producing our antibodies. So now we're basically taking what was just some DNA and we're putting that DNA into an actual B cell. If you recall, I told you at, uh, a little earlier in the semester that all of our different cells of the immune system start out um, coming from this stem cell called the hematopoietic stem cell. Um, and undergo different paths of development in order to develop into our, all of our cells of the blood. And so in some ways, what we're talking about here is, you could imagine it's sort of part of hematopoiesis. It's sort of part of these details of how we're getting to our B cell from this hematopoietic stem cell. Uh, just as a reminder, Hematopoiesis is happening um, in bone marrow um, in an org uh, a mammal once it is born. Um, there are some other locations where we see hematopoiesis happening before birth. But really, when we are thinking about um, a mammal that has been born, we're talking about bone marrow for the events that are happening here. And you can see this as well on the left, um, both in terms of um, mouse gestation and human gestation. We sort of have hematopoiesis moving in a few different locations. But at birth, um, we are seeing this happen uh, coming from bone marrow. Bone marrow contains a mixture of lots of different cells, including this cell that is listed here as S, or the stem cell. And if we do a bone marrow transplant, we can um, restore hematopoiesis. A 
couple of times I have mentioned things like um, Omen syndrome um, or different types of skid where patients don't have RAG1 and RAG2 and they can't do VDJ recombination. And I said, well, they can't make an adaptive immune system. Um, and they, those patients will die really young without treatment. Generally, what we do for treatment with the, of those patients is we give them some stem cells that have RAG1 and RAG2. And that basically allows them to have those stem cells do hematopoiesis for them normally and allows them to have a normal immune system. Um, we can have a number of different situations where um, cells of the immune system will be destroyed. Some of this we'll see uh, again later in the semester. One of those is uh, radiation, and you can see this mouse has been given radiation here. So it's basically the same kind of thing that you might get in terms of radiation um, in terms of cancer therapy. Um, and when that happens, rapidly dividing cells um, die. The idea is that you're trying to kill the cancer cells. Just so happens there are some other cells that die as well, including all of your immune system. Um, and so what we can do is we can take some bone marrow cells. Here you can see injecting bone marrow cells and it's showing you that it's two times 10 to the fifth. Um, and we can put that into the mouse and in fact, we'll just restore hematopoiesis, the mouse will live. We've basically re-given this mouse an entire immune system by putting in some of these hematopoietic stem cells. All of this developmental can happen from those cells. We can get um, that mouse's immune system re rebuilt. And in fact, this is generally why many cancer patients need bone marrow transplants because they have had similar types of radiation um, destroying their immune system um, and they need to restore hematopoiesis. One thing that always sort of gets me about this image is that it shows just this easy little injection into the mouse's back. Um, I've done these injections. They're actually um, really hard. Um, you actually need to go directly into the vein um, and do an intravenous um, in the mouse. Um, and you generally do the tail vein. Um, it's hard is the moral of the story. In fact, sometimes you miss. Um, people have done experiments. This is an experiment that was published in 1996 where they actually went to look to see how many stem cells did you need to give a mouse to regrow its entire immune system. And so in some cases, they got 20 stem cells. So they sorted out all the bone marrow and they got just 20 stem cells. And when they did that, 100% of the mice had a fully regrown immune system. So 20 will give you a whole immune system. Then they tried 10. And you can see 90%, five, you can see 50%, two, 23%, one, 20%. So the idea that I want you to see here is that a very small number of these stem cells will actually be sufficient to repopulate the entire immune system. And I told you before that the injection here is hard so when I look at these data, um, when I look at this one, I'm like, yeah, I, I bet a lot of times you actually messed up that injection. So I think that it's probably works more than 20% of the time. It's just that you mess up the injection sometimes. Um, and so I actually look at this and say, I'm pretty sure like one and two is fine. Um, this has to be related to uh, the, how difficult it is to do that injection. Um, so again, the point is you can actually get hematopoiesis from a very small number of these stem cells. They are very uh, potent at allowing for development of um, other blood cells. Recall also that when we think about hematopoiesis or any of the aspects of development of our immune cells, we are in the primary lymphoid organs. Um, there are, of course, two primary lymphoid organs, thymus and bone marrow. 
um, where different cells are developing. And when we think about B cell development, we are in the bone marrow. Um, to be perfectly honest, when we talk about this whole process of hematopoiesis, almost all of it happens in the bone marrow. There's one branch that happens outside the bone marrow, and that's a later problem for the semester. Um, but specifically, as we talk about B cell development, um, all of these steps from the hematopoietic stem cell all the way down to our um, B cell is hap will be happening in the bone marrow. And you can also see this little image on the right where we have the cell that is going to become a B cell undergoing um, rearrangement. Um, that's the VDJ rearrangement to become a B cell. You can see all of that's happening in the bone marrow. Um, and then leaving the bone marrow to go and start to protect the rest of the body. And you can see you make 5 million of those a day. You, you export 5 million a day. So that means actually 5 million a day survive this whole process. We'll talk about why they don't survive next time. Um, and um, also note that this is listed as the antigen independent phase in the bone marrow. We're not really thinking about what antigen that B cell responds to yet. The B cell is going to see antigen and do something when it leaves the bone marrow. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the antigens in the bone marrow on Friday, but you should generally think of this as being sort of antigen independent. The B cell is doing all of this randomly and not in response to antigen. And so you can just see sort of that same example here. We're in this place where the B cell is diversifying, making lots of different types of receptors, all in that bone marrow. Only later are we going to actually respond to antigen and expand. And so we're still firmly over here on the left or up here on the top. <laughs> we have not gotten to the point where we care about the antigen yet. All right, so um, we're going to start with thinking about um, B cell development in the bone marrow. And I want to tell you one kind of general piece of information that you need to know about really a lot of lymphocytes. This is going to be something that you're going to see when we talk about B cell development. It's also going to be something you see when we later talk about T cell development. It's a theme that comes up over and over with a lot of our uh, developing lymphocytes. And what you can think about is that our developing lymphocytes, you can imagine as being really needy. They need a lot of uh, signals that tell them, you're doing a good job. You're good, good job. <laughs> you can imagine that many of these developing lymphocytes without uh, signals may uh, are actually going to undergo apoptosis. So, and hope, thank you. Um, so basically, we need to constantly be telling these cells, "Good job, you're good, you're doing a good job," um, or else they die. And so, one of the things that you need to realize about uh, B cell development in the bone marrow is why in the world is this process happening in the bone marrow? And the reason that this process is happening in the bone marrow is because there are lots of structural cells. Um, you can see this one labeled here in your textbook as a stromal cell. You can also kind of see this in a little more of a 3D way at the bottom where we've got lots of sort of bone related cells in the bone marrow that are making growth factors to help those very needy developing cells not die. So if we had one of those developing cells out in the rest of the body, it wouldn't be getting all of that nice support and all of those growth factors that it needs to help it through its developmental process. 
So you can see that some of them are cell surface proteins, some of them are secreted proteins, um, but there are a lot, you can notice lots of different types of support and help that that bone marrow cells are actually giving to the developing B cell before it gets to the point of being a B cell. Um, and you can see some of those interactions happening here as well. So that B cell is actually interacting a lot with structural cells of the bone marrow in order to get um, the growth factors it needs. One specific growth factor that I will mention is called IL-7. You can see IL-7 here. You can also see IL-7 here. You can see some of the, the cells of the bone marrow make this IL-7 um, that binds to the developing B cell. IL-7 is sort of a famous cytokine in the immune system in that it makes immune cells survive. So it's the survival factor. Um, so basically, this poor developing cell is going around through the bone marrow, and it needs a pretty constant supply of IL-7 um, to be t old to survive um, until it has sort of finished growing up and developing. And so the bone marrow is a great source of IL-7 um, to help support those developing cells. Um, so again, all of these steps are happening in the bone marrow. Um, and your textbook does this really nice job in uh, figure 6.1 and 6.2 of kind of uh, dividing up stages of the B cell's life and color coding where they happen. And so again, we are really thinking here about the yellow location, the bone marrow, and the yellow events. The pink locations and the pink events happen after the exam. Um, but the yellow is what we're going to be focusing on here. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to, this is sort of what we're going to be thinking about today and on Friday. Uh, I have one other kind of general thing I need to um, tell you about before I get into some of the specific details of uh, B cell development. I mentioned to you that developing lymphocytes are really needy. They need lots of signals. And so we have to talk a little bit more about some details related to signals because we're going to see those signals as part of the development of our B cell. Um, so in order for a B cell to get a signal, it needs to get um, in a, something bound to a receptor so we can get signal transduction. At the very beginning, that receptor might be the IL-7 receptor, responding to IL-7. Eventually, that receptor is a receptor that you might see here on the surface of the B cell. Um, which we cleverly call the B cell receptor. So the way that we turn on and activate B cells most of the time is with this B cell receptor. The B cell receptor is an antibody, basically, that has a transmembrane domain. So the B cell receptor is made by VDJ recombination just like the antibody is. So it turns out that um, before we've done VDJ recombination, we don't have a B cell receptor to give us signals. We're just hanging out as a needy cell, wanting some signals that we can't get because we don't have a B cell receptor yet. Then we're going to do VDJ recombination. That's going to give us a B cell receptor so that we can get signals through that B cell receptor. That's also going to give us what we need to make the antibody. So I'm largely going to be talking about the B cell receptor today as we talk about VDJ recombination. But in fact, it's the same process we've been talking about in terms of making the antibody. So we have to think a little bit about signal transduction to fully understand or fully think through what's going to happen. So this is a very general scheme 
related to signal transduction. I'm going to talk about the type of receptor that we see on the top. It's one of a few types of receptors. The one on the bottom is kind of a similar modification, but really if we think about the one on the top, it's sort of the most important. Um, often the, with the one on the top, we call it something called a receptor tyrosine kinase or an RTK. What, what does receptor mean? What's a receptor? Yeah, Jameer. Yeah, something that binds to some other thing. Something that's going to bind our signal. Okay, what's a kinase? Has ACE at the end, so we might remember it's an enzyme. What's a kinase? Yeah, Michael. Okay. So a kinase is an enzyme that phosphorylates. What's a ty what's tyrosine? Yeah, Jay. It's an amino acid. And just for your knowledge, happens to be an amino acid that is really good at getting phosphorylated. <laughs> so when, when I think about signal transduction, I often think about um, things that are called receptor tyrosine kinases. And receptor tyrosine kinases have three key pieces to them, three key parts. The receptor part, the tyrosine part, and the kinase part. So if you can remember their name is receptor tyrosine kinase, then you know all three of the important parts they have. And you can see an example of a receptor tyrosine kinase at the top here. What you can see is that oftentimes, um, there, we might have parts of the receptor that are proteins that are separate from one another um, in uh, the cell's membrane. And remember when you think about plasma membranes that proteins can diffuse around in the plasma membrane. They're not stuck. It's really hard sometimes for students to remember this because we can only draw pictures where they look stuck. Because um, I don't know how to draw it nor do even people who actually know drawing know how to do that. Um, so we've got proteins that are kind of just diffusing in 360 degrees, totally not near each other <laughs> through the cell. If, however, the ligand is present, the ligand will bring those proteins close together, um, specifically bringing those extracellular domains close together. So here you can see our protein just sort of diffusing around wherever. Now ligand is around and that sort of catches the molecules and holds them close together, specifically holding the extracellular domain close together. It just so happens if the extracellular domains are close together, the intracellular domains have to get close together too. They have to get pulled next to each other as well. And those intracellular domains have um, enzymatic activity. They have the kinase domain. Um, and they can actually 
phosphorylate one another. So when they were off diffusing around, not next to each other, they would never phosphorylate one another. When they get brought next to each other, suddenly they can actually um, get phosphorylation because they're being held um, in proximity. This is actually known as the proximity model of signal transduction. Um, and now that we have this phosphorylation, we can get additional events happening in signaling. Um, the bottom of this shows you kind of a similar kind of receptor here. Technically, the kinase and the receptor are different proteins that work together instead of being all one protein. But otherwise, it's the same idea. So this is kind of a very standard way that signal transduction tends to work. So now we can think about the B cell receptor. Here is our B cell receptor. I use this figure of the B cell receptor very intentionally. So if there are things you notice in this figure, I picked this figure because it shows what I want you to show. So you might, so like you're probably supposed to notice the things. Um, so this is our B cell receptor. It, has, it is the product of VDJ recombination, all of that hard work that we learned about before. But if you look at it compared to this idea that I told you about of the receptor tyrosine kinase, which is a pretty important, pretty famous kind of receptor in cell biology, how does the B cell receptor compare to the receptor tyrosine kinase? I will remind you that the kinase part that we saw on our receptor tyrosine kinase, as well as the tyrosine, the spot that got phosphorylated, were part of the intracellular part of this receptor. So what do you notice about the B cell receptor? Yep, Jameer. There, there's no intracellular part. And in fact, that's true. There are like a couple amino acids. There is really no intracellular domain on the B cell receptor. So the B cell receptor is amazing at this receptor part. We did this whole VDJ recombination business so that we can bind to signal and be a really good receptor. But it kind of sucks at the tyrosine and the kinase part because there's no intracellular domain for the rest of this signaling. The B cell receptor is able to actually signal because it gets some help from friends. So the B cell receptor functions with two other proteins that associate closely with it. These proteins are not made through VDJ recombination, so every B cell, and in fact every person has the same versions of these. Um, they're known as Ig alpha and Ig beta. They are also sometimes known as CD79A and CD79B. Um, and what you can see is they don't really have much in the way of a receptor domain. They don't actually bind much to anything, but they have a really nice tyrosine, which is what's being shown here in this yellow, in order to get phosphorylated. So they actually um, bring along um, part of this receptor, and we'll see Ig alpha and Ig beta um, a little bit later. Um, you still don't see the kinase here. What I will tell you about the kinase is that there are other proteins involved that involve the kinase. And we do not care about them right now. So I will promise you that there is a kinase and it works well <laughs> and that you don't have to care about it right now. Um, so there are other receptors that are part of this signaling as well that provide the kinase. 
Um, and so generally what will happen on our B cell is that we have a B cell receptor that will be traveling around and it actually travels around with Ig alpha and Ig beta. So I showed you before this idea that different proteins sort of diffuse through the membrane separately from one another. Um, this is one example where they don't, where they actually travel together. Um, I always geek out about this because it was actually one of my friends in grad school who proved why this was. Um, and so every time I, he's proved it first for the T cell um, and then did it for the B cell. But every time I see the stuff, I'm like, ha I was there. I remember the, like, the first time we saw that data. Um, so they travel together, um, but we still don't get a whole lot of good signaling going on until we bring two or more B cell receptors together with antigen. So it's the same kind of idea. We'll have those B cell receptors just floating around cell membrane. If antigen comes along, say with multiple uh, copies of its same epitope, it can pull together two B cell receptors. It will make them suddenly, it will hold them close to each other. They'll be in induced proximity. And uh, it's officially also known as cross-linking them. And that will allow us to get a signal. So this is sort of what the B cell really needs in order to get a signal, in order to get that nice little pat on the head of, you did a good job. You made a good receptor. When that happens, signal transduction happens. You do not need to know any further details of this slide. I'm showing you this as a general idea, that signal transduction happens and we'll get things like changes in gene expression. We'll get some changes in the cytoskeleton. We'll get lots of changes in the cell. When we get to T cells, we're gonna talk through a pathway of the T, the T cell pathway like this. And you know what you're gonna find out? It's actually identical to the B cell pathway. So why should I tell you about it now? All right, so um, we are going to be focusing on B cell development in the bone marrow. And really, we're sort of looking at this side. So our B cell is coming from the lymphoid progenitor because it's a lymphoid cell. And you can see it's coming down this arrow. So it went from a hematopoietic stem cell to a lymphoid cell, eventually to a B cell. And this is all happening in the bone marrow. Your textbook here shows this process as just sort of arrow. Um, there are a number of steps along this arrow um, that our B cell will undergo. So we can divide up different parts along this arrow, just like what's shown in figure 6.3. We are really going to start thinking about a cell called a pro B cell. The pro B cell is kind of the first cell we're really gonna care about. So yes, before we got to our pro B cell, our hematopoietic stem cell had to say, I want to be a lymphoid cell when I grow up. And it had to commit to being lymphoid as opposed to myeloid. And then in fact, it had to say, I want to be a B cell and be some kind of B cell precursor. We are going to start this cell as the pro B cell. So as we think about some of these different cells, we are going to be thinking about a few different um, important pieces of them. So as we think about some of these different cell types, we're going to think about what is this cell doing? This, each of the cells I'll tell you about have specific events that they do. We're also going to think about what does this cell have on its surface? 
um, what proteins are on its surface. And in particular, when I think about what proteins are on this surface, I'm thinking about what kind of B cell receptor proteins. You can see my pro B cell has a bunch of proteins on its surface. CD127, CD34, CD19, CD10. Really, when I think about what's on the surface right now, I'm thinking about what kind of B cell receptor stuff. And so our first kind of cell that we're going to think about is the pro B cell. So again, as I said, yes, the cell had to go through some stuff between being a stem cell and being a pro B cell, but we're not going to focus on that. We're going to focus first on this pro B cell. And um, this textbook where I'm showing you some information as well as your textbook, um, they both actually um, will divide up some of this. And so they will divide up pro B cells into early and late. Um, you'll see kind of, it will make sense as we go through this, how they're dividing them up. But first we'll just start with the pro B cell. And I really like these figures because again, they show this correctly. So we can see our pro B cells here. And you can see our pro B cells here in green. So these are drawn entirely correctly. If you look at the pro B cell, what B cell receptor proteins are on the surface of this cell? Like you can look right here. This is a good example, or all of those are good examples. What B cell receptor protein is on the surface of this cell? None. So the answer to what B cell receptor proteins are on the surface of a pro B cell is none. The reason why there are no B cell receptor proteins on the surface of the pro B cell it's because they haven't made any yet. So as a hint of what they might be doing, <laughs> it's going to be doing some of the making of them. Specifically, they are going to do um, one important part of making the uh, B cell receptor. The pro B cell is going to be doing VJ rearrangement of the heavy chain. So the pro B cell is going to be making the heavy chain. The early pro B cell is going to take its D heavy and rearrange it to J heavy. The later one is going to take V heavy and make it uh, bound to uh, DJ. And so you can see, um, first part of this is putting D and J together. Then the next part of it is putting V with DJ. And so this is, these are the events that the pro B cell is doing. So do you think that the pro B cell is likely to have RAG1 and RAG2 active in that cell. Michael's, Michael's saying yes. Yes, it, we're, we're, do, we're actually using RAG1 and RAG2, so we better have it. But now we have to have sort of our next step. I'm going to write some things in my little table that I'm making over here, and then I'm going to come back and explain it. Once we have made the heavy chain, 
We've put V, D, and J heavy together. You can put them on the surface of the cell. And when you put them on the surface of the cell, suddenly we must be, we're somewhere else on the table. We don't have none anymore on the surface. We now have heavy chain on the surface. So we must qualify as something else. Um, and now we qualify as a pre B cell um, once we have this heavy chain on the surface. Heavy chain is not the only thing on the surface of a pre B cell. Before I tell you about the other thing that is on the surface of the pre B cell, I want to talk about what the heck the point is of doing heavy chain <laughs> up there. Yeah, heavy chain has to have a partner. But first, we're going to talk about why the heck you want to put heavy chain there in the first place. So we can do our D to J rearrangement. And as this, the book says, we're generally going to do D to J rearrangement on both chromosomes both mom and dad's chromosome that have this has this genetic material. And what we need to, and then eventually we're going to um, put a V with a DJ on one of those two chromosomes. Honestly, whether it happens on mom's chromosome or dad's chromosome is totally a matter of randomness of which one finishes first. Whichever one the cell finishes is doing first is the one it goes with. But there's a problem. Sometimes when this rearrangement happens, when we put together a V, a D, and a J, we get a heavy chain. But sometimes we fail. Sometimes we make a failure of a protein. There's one really big reason for this, although there, are, there can be many reasons, but there's one really big one. Remember junctional diversity? Remember our P and N nucleotides, and also the fact that we could subtract base pairs uh, at some point? Um, did I ever tell you anything about numbers of base pairs added or subtracted there? Did I ever say, you always add 12? Or did I, give, did I ever give you a specific number? No. But what happens, let's imagine, if the end result of that process was that we added five base pairs? Can you imagine any issues that might come if we add five base pairs? Harame says yes. What can, what's the, the issue? OK. So. Um, there's five, and so we can get bases across from them, and we can get a base pairing that way. But the five is a problem. Yeah, Ermi. So the problem is, um, as sort of Ermi saying here, so here's V, here's D, Here's J. Here's like stop codon. Right? If you add five base pairs right there, you're going to push the rest of this whole protein out of frame. You might add a stop codon here where there wasn't supposed to be one. Because remember, when we are reading these bases, to translate them, the ribosome reads in multiples of three. So if our adding and subtracting is of something other than a multiple of three, we're at risk of putting in a stop codon somewhere where there shouldn't be one. And then we're not going to get the whole protein. We might get just a little arm of the protein and then nothing else. So we won't get a full heavy chain. We'll get basically this useless failure of a protein. 
Do you understand why this could fail? So sometimes this is going to happen, and the cell at this point is going to be a failure. Does it make sense to keep going with that cell? No. So what this cell is going to do now is it's going to test the heavy chain it's made in order to see if it actually has a protein <laughs> that's a heavy chain. So we're going to put that heavy chain that the cell has made on the surface of the cell. And we're going to see if we can get a signal through it. <laughs> if we can't get a signal through it, then something's wrong and we shouldn't keep going. But if it does work, which you can see here, then we're going to um, have that nice signal. The B cell receptor usually looks like what is shown here on the right, where we have a heavy chain and a light chain on the surface of the cell. The heavy chain and the light chain are both needed to get proper protein folding here. At this point, our pre-B cell has made a heavy chain, but it hasn't made a light chain yet. So it's really hard for it to throw that heavy chain up on the surface when it doesn't have a light chain to pair it with. So in our pre-B cell, there are some other proteins that take the job of the light chain. Um, sometimes we could think of them as the fake light chain. <laughs> They're officially known as the surrogate light chain. Um, their goal, their idea is to be next to that heavy chain, to kind of take the spot of the light chain and allow us to test the heavy chain and see if that heavy chain works before we um, go through all the trouble of making a light chain. So our pre-B cell has the heavy chain on its surface as well as the surrogate light chain. The surrogate light chain has two parts. One is called v, v pre B. The other is called lambda 5. At some point, I will mention something called lambda. And lambda and lambda 5 are not the same, because why could we make anything easy? So note that I'm saying lambda 5 here. Um, this combination of the heavy chain and the surrogate light chain is known as the pre-B cell receptor. And pre-B cells are defined as cells that have a pre-B cell receptor. So our pre-B cell has the heavy chain and the surrogate light chain. Lambda 5 and B pre B. All of that together is known as the pre BCR, the pre B cell receptor. So the pre B cell has a pre B cell receptor. So you can see that same definition here that. Our cell is a pro B cell when it doesn't have any uh, B cell receptor proteins on its surface. Once it makes a heavy chain, it puts it up on the surface in order to test it. And now we call that cell a pre B cell. Realize that the pre B cell receptor cannot bind to antigen because it doesn't have a real heavy chain and real light chain. It's got that fake light chain. But the surrogate light chain has these weird little tails so, we can hold e so they can actually hold next to each other and cross-link themselves. So basically, if there is a protein, we get a signal. Doesn't matter what the antigen is, just if you are a competent protein, you can make this little link on the cell surface and get a signal. That's all. 
when the cell gets its signals through the pre-B cell receptor, it does a couple of different things. So there are a few functions or, uh, of this signal coming from the pre-B cell receptor. So if you think about it from what I've told you so far, what is the first message that you think that cell probably ought to get? What is the first thing you think that cell ought, should probably do? Remember just how needy lymphocytes are. So if we get a cell, a signal from the pre-B cell receptor, what should that tell us? Yeah? Yeah, number one, you did a good job, don't die. So the first thing that this cell is going to get is a signal to survive. So the pre-B um, cell, it, the pre-B cell receptor is going to tell this cell, please survive, <laughs> please don't die. We're also going to have a second sort of related thing that our cell is going to do. Not only is our cell going to survive, our cell is also gonna go through some rounds of cell division, AKA proliferation. <laughs> When that cell has been successful in making a heavy chain, we want to make more copies of that cell. Because what we could do is we could take this successful heavy chain we've worked so hard to make, and we could have all of the progeny make different light chains, and we could pair that successful heavy chain with multiple light chains. So we should make multiple progeny here so we can do lots of tries with different light chains. So we're going to have that cell proliferate. Um, and you can see it um, in two different places. So that pre-B cell is going to proliferate. Um, we're also going to do another really critical thing here. The, next, the other big thing we're going to do is we're going to turn off RAG1 and RAG2 for a little while. We actually need to turn off RAG1 and RAG2 before we proliferate because we do not want any chance of DNA damage while we're proliferating. So those enzymes that do the cutting of the DNA, we do not want them around. We're gonna sort of turn them off for a bit so we have proliferation time. We will eventually turn them back on. Um, so you can sort of see this here as well that, um, the earliest pre-B cells turn RAG right on off because um, they do not want to damage their DNA um, while they are proliferating. Turning off RAG also has another important function. I'm going to describe this one in a couple of different ways because for some of you, I'll say it and you'll be like, okay. And for some of you, you'll be like, what? No. And the reason why is because you need some extra Molgen info. So some of those of you who've had Molgen are gonna be like, nope, need more info. Um, those of you who haven't won't need the info. So I gotta give it to you both ways. Um, so the other big thing that happens because we turn off RAG here is that we get allelic exclusion at the heavy chain. So this is showing you the chromosomes where our light chains and heavy chains are. Um, we're looking right now at chromosome 14 and remember that you have chromosome 14 from mom, chromosome 14 from dad. So you actually have this twice in, in all of your developing B cells and all your other cells too, but we only care about the developing B cells today. You are going to put together D and J on both mom's chromosome and dad's chromosome. 
you're then going to put together V with DJ on one of the chromosomes. And it's basically a race. One of them is going to get done first. Once that one is finished, you don't want the other one to, to keep going. The other one needs to stop. <laughs> because if the other one doesn't stop, you're going to get a B cell with all these mixed up receptors. You only want that B cell to make one kind of heavy chain. You don't want that B cell making two kinds of heavy chains. You don't want it to make a mom's chromosome heavy chain and dad's chromosome heavy chain. You want it to make one. So the idea here is whichever of those two chromosomes finishes um, rearrangement first is going to, we're going to have that protein be produced and put on the surface of the cell. And we're going to turn off RAG for a little while. And that's going to ensure that the other chromosome can't do its rearrangement. We can't finish rearranging that other chromosome. Um, and so that is this allelic exclusion of the heavy chain. Um, we are eventually going to turn RAG back on. Some of you may say, well, then why don't we finish the heavy chain when we turn RAG back on? The answer is because we actually also do some pretty big chromatin modifications here. So heavy chains can't, you can't play with heavy chains after this. It's not a choice. Heavy chains become completely not a choice <laughs> at this point because of chromatin modification. Um, so don't worry about like the heavy chain getting rearranged later. Um, we are, it is completely excluded from further rearrangement um, once it gets a signal from the pre-B cell receptor. Do you have a question? Next slide. Well, we, we're coming there. Great, great question. We're, that's exactly where we're going. Um, so um, just to kind of, um, in fact, I, I think I will address that now. Um, well, I'll, I'll say one other thing first. Um, the other thing that happens when we get this signal, so when, if it was successful, is that we stop making surrogate light chain because we just used it and we don't need it and we don't need to make more. We're, we're getting ready to move on to the step where you don't need it. So we stop making it. So we completely shut off production of surrogate light chain. And if we are successful, we're gonna turn RAG back on and we're going to do light chain rearrangement. And I'll say more about that light chain rearrangement. Um, but the events that our pre-B cell are doing First, testing the heavy chain. Um, so basically looking for a signal, and that will result in survival, proliferation, allelic exclusion. Turn off surrogate light chain production. And then our pre-B cell is going to um, make light chain. So this is all in the assumption that we were successful and we made a heavy chain protein. But as Jameer points out, it's also possible that we could be a failure. We could have not made a correct protein, perhaps because of the frame shift problem. If we didn't make a correct protein, when we try to send that protein up onto the surface of the cell, it's not going to work. And we're not going to get any signals to our cell. In that case, we're never going to turn off RAG. And we're going to keep going and rearrange the second chromosome as well. So if we get a hit if we get a positive result from the first chromosome. Hooray, the cell survives and gets to be a pre-B cell, do fun pre-B cell things. If the cell fails, well, it just keeps rearranging the other chromosome. It gets a second try to try to make a successful protein. 
if it is correct and successfully makes a protein, hooray! Now we've got a protein on the surface of the cell and we get to proceed as a previous cell. If the cell fails again, it's got no more chromosomes. It's done. It cannot make a heavy chain. It is not going to get the signal it, that needy DD cell needs and it's gonna die by apoptosis. But good news, it had two chances um, to make that heavy chain. And so here you can kind of see this um, in uh, a view from a different textbook. So we're gonna make D to J. We're gonna try V to DJ on one chromosome. It might work. We might make a pre-B cell or it might fail. So we might try the other one. Maybe it works. Maybe it fails. If it fails, then the cell dies. But it had two chances to not die. Does this make sense? Okay. Um, so, as, yeah, oh, sorry. So if it works, it moves on to the light chain. No, yep, and that's exactly where I'm going on the next slide. If it works, it moves on to the light chain. <laughs> Perfect. The next thing that happens is we turn on rag one and two. Thank you for reading my mind. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so now the cell, it's gotten its signal. It's been successful. Um, it's going to turn on rag one and rag two. But now that rag one and rag two are going to be acting at the light chain instead of acting at the heavy chain. Um, and really, this is because of um, chromatin availability. Um, and so again, you can see we can kind of we had previously divided up our pro B cells into two steps, the D to J step and then the V to DJ step. We can do the same thing for our um, pre B cells. We've got the ones that are sort of testing and then the ones that are doing, that are making the light chain. So our, you can see our pre B cells are now going to make the light chain. If you had to guess, what was going to happen based on what you've seen before? What do you think is going to happen once we have finished making a light chain, doing V, v to J recombination of the light chain? What might you guess is going to happen? Yeah, Michael. Oh, maybe you're gonna test it. And so would you, what, what, what might be on the surface of the cell suddenly? Yeah, full BCR, heavy chain plus light chain, because now you've made them both. So you're going to put them both on the surface of the cell. As Michael said, this is the full BCR. So now you're going to put this whole thing on the surface. Now we have a new thing on the surface, so we must qualify as a new kind of cell. Um, and we do, we now qualify as something called an immature B cell. And Michael, what would you guess that the immature B cell is going to do? Um, test the B cell. Specifically, which part? The light chain. Might test the light chain? Oh my gosh, guess what the immature B cell does? It tests the light chain. <laughs> so a big part of what happens with immature B cells is that we're going to test the light chain. Um, we, um, part of the testing of the light chain is about did you make a functional protein? Did you actually make a protein that's in frame? There is a second type of testing, however, that we have to do at this point. And those two types of testing are what we will be talking about on Friday. Um, so I will see you guys on Friday, but I will actually see you in lab before that. Um, I will have uh, stuff to hand out. I'll have like printouts of things for you in lab. Um, so I will see you then. <laughs>